Well, howdy out there. <laughs> I thought I would make a video uh, regarding uh, the future possibility of transplanting the human brain into a robotic carrier. And I was watching, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? His last name is the same as mine on TV, on PBS. Charlie Rose. And he had uh, Paul Allen. Uh, the co-founder of Microsoft on there and it turns out that, that he's interested in many of the things that I'm interested in like music um, the brain and all sorts of things but anyway I back in the 80's I was a pre-med student in college and I switched over to electronics and back in the 80's I put together the world's first um, human brain waves to electronic speech system and I used uh, a ZX81 which was the forerunner of the TS-1000 and uh, the TS-1000 I later switched over from the TS-81 um, only had 1k memory RAM <laughs> and so uh, the 4K packs came out. I think they were 4K or maybe they were 16K. I forget now. But anyway, my original system is in a museum in Phoenix, Arizona. Minus the brainwave pickup because after 20 years it, it didn't want to work anymore. But what this computer system did, and, and I built many of the components uh, for this. I built the ZX81 and later bought some T TS1000s. What this computer system did was put on some electrodes on your on your head, input your brain waves, and then via uh, basic programming, um, you would think of a word, let's say hello, <clears throat> and then you would look at the decimal printouts of the thought coming into the computer, and so you would pick. The, the number, the decimal number for the word hello which was the most prevalent. In other words if you were thinking hello and 95 out of 100 times the number 68 came out then you would assign in another program you know if BW is meaning the input coming in was equal to 68 then print hello and below that, I had another line of code which said, which said, and if B waves equal to 68, then line print hello. So it was like a robot. The printer was like functioning like a robot because it would turn on and print every time the computer got a hit from the brain waves. And of course, I was able to do more than just one word hello. I had symbols like double eyeballs and things like that. Uh, I have a sense of humor, you know, and uh, and, and uh, I wrote a book on the, on the subject, how you would build your own system using a Timex 1000. Okay, so that was back in the 80s, and now I learned that uh, the basic code that was written was written by this guy, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. I think he invented the basic language. That, that's the impression I get anyway. So uh, I wrote a book on how you build your own system and uh, a few years back I got it published on lulu.com so if anybody wants to download a copy of the book for five bucks and I'm not getting rich off of this believe me not too many people are interested in this kind of thing you can do it for only five bucks get a copy of the book and we'll have uh, all the components you need in the book where to get them and things like that if they're still available because it's been uh, over 25 years right and uh, including the uh, programs that I used to first observe the incoming brain waves and then assign numbers to them in the program and um, you can use that as a, as a guide to produce your own brainwave to speech system but uh, now we have like I have right now 
a Hewlett Packard uh, uh, computer running uh, base, uh, running Vista, Vista, and I don't know how to program in Windows. <laughs> I would need a programmer that could convert my basic statements into Windows, uh, you know, uh, or C++ or whatever they use. Uh, in order to make a modern system, but with the gigantic hard drives that we have now, boy, we could really put together a really good futuristic brainwave-to-speech computer system. Now, when I when I made that first system, I thought, oh boy, I'm going to get the Nobel Prize for this, a <laughs> million dollars, and then I can build a bigger system. But it didn't work out that way. It seemed like nobody was really interested. Although Dr. Dobbs' journal did write a small article about uh, my system. And uh, they wanted me to come up to San Francisco to demonstrate it, but at that time, I, I had a wife and a kid, I had to work. I couldn't just dump everything and go up to San Francisco. So um, basically, what I did is I went and used my uncle's um, very first computer system, personal PC, it was out. Uh, I think, who put that out? IBM. I used his IBM PC to write the book. And I had a professor in a university uh, edit my book. And I also demonstrated the system to him and several other professors. And they were scratching their heads saying, geez, how does that work? <laughs> and they were, they were computer lab professors. So uh, later on, I... Uh, I had some uh, dealings with a, a psychologist uh, who, who has passed away since and uh, he decided he liked my system and he was going to go and have his te technician build one for him but I don't care you know but you know when you uh, when you invent something really great or at least you think it's really great and the world doesn't be a path to your door you go damn, what am I doing, <laughs> you know? Am I wasting my time here? But then when I saw this guy Paul Allen on the Charlie Rose show, kind of got me inspired um, to think that uh, you could come up with a modern brainwave to speech system, but beyond that, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a Dr. White's work, Dr. White. This guy was transplanting heads from one chimp to another onto another so that one chimp had two heads <clears throat> and the head was alive and looking around and everything and so I you know I, I checked into that and I figured you know someday uh, we'll be able to either do that with humans or better yet uh, actually remove the brain the human brain and put it into a robotic carrier with the brain waves guiding the robot. Now they do have artificial limbs and things like that now that are being guided by brain waves. In fact, uh, my uncle, uh, who I wrote the very first, whose computer I wrote the very first book on, uh, and, and the book on Lulu is Human Brain Waves to Electronic Speech 3, and you might have to, in their search box, look for William H. Rose are put in that title, Human Brain Waves to Electronic Speech 3. Uh, my uncle was really interested in that, and he had friends because he had formerly worked in a hospital called Hahnemann in Philadelphia. And I'm pretty sure he took a copy of the book over to the hospital, and they were developing brainwave controlled artificial limbs. And uh, I didn't follow on that, and uh, I wrote them a couple of emails, and they never answered me. So, you know, technology has a way of not invented here, and uh, uh, yeah, we like that idea, we're going to make our own, <laughs> and you get screwed, you know. So, uh, fortunately for uh, Bill Gates and this guy Paul Allen, they somehow managed to keep their technology secret until they could get it out uh, into the public as a product. And he even said, Alan even said, that they were really afraid that somebody else might beat them to it. But they came out with uh, 
I forget what, what it was they first came out with, I guess the code for an IBM machine. And I think Apple, Apple invented the mouse, didn't they? The pirates of, uh, what you might call it, Valley. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so what I would need if I wanted to, say, conduct experiments, you have to start out with cow brains and things like that, to uh, transplant a cow brain or remove it from the cow and put it into into the uh, robotic carrier. First of all, you have to figure out, you know, how you're going to pump the blood carrying the glucose through the brain. So. In order for me to get involved in those experiments, even though I was a pre-med student and uh, now I'm just an engineering electronic technician, retired, I would need uh, doctors and a laboratory and uh, technicians uh, to all come together under one program and uh, start research. But you know, uh, we're, we're like real close to a depression or in a depression, I don't know what. But evidently, there are people out there with those interests that have money. So, um, if anyone's interested, I'd be interested in working in a project like that. If you provide the money, because <laughs> I'm on Social Security, I don't get I get less than a thousand a month. Obviously, I can't uh, do any kind of medical experiments with no license, unless I move to Mexico or something like that. But I'm not going to play Frankenstein in Mexico. You would have to be on the up and up. <laughs> so, um, I'm talking to all of you neurosurgeons and brain scientists and robotic experts and rich people out there who would like to have a project like that. I would like to be involved and kind of coordinate the project and uh, Use my ideas, and eventually we could put a human brain into a robotic carrier, just like that little Japanese robot they have, you know, you can walk up and down stairs. Well, we could make one taller and uh, operate it by the brain waves of the brain of the human brain that's in that robotic carrier. Now, you know, one of the things you, you think about, you think, well, gee, you know, Who's going to donate their brain? <laughs> Maybe somebody with a terminal medical condition who figures they only got a couple of months to live. Their body's failing them. They need another body. But you can't, you know, take somebody else's body and put the brain into it. That's not legal or ethical or moral. But you can put it into a robotic carrier. Then you wonder, you know, they say that the brain does not feel any pain. So. Obviously, for the eyes, we'd have to use TV cameras, and for the ears, we'd have to use microphones. And um, we just wonder if there would be any pain involved for the subject. You know, it's an unknown. We're, we're walking into unknown territory here. <laughs> so, um, but you know, if somebody's going to croak in a couple of months, and they say, "Well, I, I'll volunteer," you know. Okay, well, after we've gotten the procedures down using a cow brain or a dog brain or whatever animal brain, you know, mammal brain, hmm, I wonder if a porpoise brain would work. But porpoises don't know English, so, well, neither do cows or dogs, but still, uh, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> I think maybe a porpoise brain is too big, I'm not sure. But, uh, so there you go. It's, it's an idea uh, on the cutting edge of science, uh, one that I'd sure like to be involved in because someday, you know, maybe my body's going to fail me, maybe in the next 10, 20 years. And then I'll say, hey, put my brain into a robotic carrier and I can live another 200 years or whatever. You know, and all you have to do is keep that brain alive with the proper solutions being pumped. So that would be the first step, is to find out how to keep a brain alive with the proper solutions being pumped through it. You know, what's interesting is that uh, the human body makes its own blood. You know, if you lose blood, 
somehow it miraculously reappears like oil in the ground they, t they pump it dry and 20 years later it's full again who, who knows how that happens but uh, <laughs> yeah how does, how does the human body make blood see that's something I never studied in my physiology classes in my pre-med course there and I studied uh, you know psychology and physiological psychology or was it psychological physiology I forget now and the three nervous systems etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's when I realized I should switch over to electronics because the only way you're going to get any information from the brain is via electronics and now that's all starting to happen big time you know with uh, CAT scans and MRIs and things like that and there's a lot of advanced research going on in universities uh, looking at the brain and how the different sections light up when different ideas happen and things like that. They discover that when a person is in prayer that one portion of their brain lights up activity you know so there might be something to uh, you know I've always tried to keep myself healthy using my own brain and it works. Sometimes I get a cold, sometimes I get a sore throat but I, I managed to make it all go away using my mind and I'm, I'm worried that someday something will happen that I can't can't do that with and that'll be the time to put the brain into the old robotic carrier and you know when you think about something like that and how far away the stars are like the nearest star is like four light years away uh, maybe that's one way we could get human intelligence to that star what is it uh, Alpha Centauri or something like that and uh, even though it would go out and come back uh, and we would all be gone it would bring back whatever intelligence it gathered using a human brain so that's you know I suggested that to NASA way long ago back in the eight, late 80s or early 90s who knows what they're doing <laughs> they don't tell you nothing but uh yeah, so if there's any uh, research organizations out there, and I'm hoping I sent e, uh, uh, Twitters to Paul Allen, I'm hoping he's interested in that, and uh, maybe we could get, get together and throw around some ideas or whatever. But if, if he never answers me, oh well, you know, Microsoft, they never answered me about my brainwaves and speech system, and now they're trying to do it, and they got these. PhDs putting in all kinds of filters and stuff like that. You don't need any damn filters. <laughs> but anyway, at least my system didn't, and I, I'm sure I could produce a, a modern system using this, or a like one, a human Packard computer or whatever, uh, with a humongous uh, hard drive, because things are really quick now. So uh, anybody out there is uh, with with a lab and personnel and bucks is interested in what I'm talking about they can contact me at wcd207 at gmail.com and I'll put that below the video and this is the first video I made beyond 15 minutes because Google said I can do it or, or was it Google? No, it's YouTube well it's Google and YouTube did it together they said I can make videos over 15 minutes, so we'll see. This is running up on 19 minutes now. We'll see what happens. So, adios.